right. I can see by the, the looks on your faces that many of you are having a hard time containing your excitement being here at 8 o'clock in the morning. Am I right? <laughs> Don't worry. I'll try and keep the class somewhat entertaining and whatnot. I know um, uh, being here this early sucks. But, but ultimately, I think uh, we'll have a lot of fun, and hopefully you'll learn something. So um, usually this is the point where I introduce myself since it's a freshman class, but I'm getting the feeling... I know there was a sea of faces in Engineering 103, but I think just about everybody in here knows who I am, right? Um, if for those of you who don't, I'm Dr. Michelson. I'm going to be your instructor this semester, and we're going to be talking a little bit about engineering computations. Um, first off, let me just go through uh, this. I, I, I try and do an announcement slide at the beginning of class, so uh, I really don't have any announcements for today since it's the first day. Uh, we are going to uh, start assigning homework, though, on Thursday. Um, uh, you'll have your first homework given then. The way that this class works, you're, you're usually afforded quite a bit of time during lecture to work on your homework, so this isn't really a, a, a very work demanding class. It's really more about participation and, uh, and, uh, and being here on time and whatnot. So, so um, ultimately, ultimately, I think that'll, that'll uh, work out for you. Uh, today we're just going to go over the, the basic strokes of the course and uh, just go over some basic stuff regarding problem solving tools uh, and what have you. Um, I'll do my best to try and um, uh, make sure that you're, you're active and engaged throughout the, the class period. But, I mean, I won't lie to you. There probably will be some days here and there where, where it's, you know, we meet from 8 to 9.15 and maybe it's 8.50 and it's, okay, we're done. You know, so that, that, that might happen that we'll leave early. And that, that might even happen today. Um, I'm not saying it'll happen all the time. And, then, uh, but, uh, and I know that that can kind of suck if you're, stuck here for a little while for classes, but we'll, we'll do our best to, to keep you active uh, as much as we can. Um, what I'm going to do now, let me start off and, uh, and go through the, uh, the syllabus, and uh, we'll just go through how the class operates and whatnot. I'm going to start a sign-in sheet, though, right here, if you could just take that and just sort of pass it around uh, and whatnot. All right. <coughs> First off, um, I gave you all a, a, a hard copy of the syllabus. Um, here you go. Anybody not get one? Oh, there you go. I gave you all a, a, a hard copy of the syllabus, but I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best this semester to try and be somewhat green. Um, in, in other words, I'm gonna try and use uh, Blackboard for the dissemination of all the notes uh, and whatnot. There will be some days where we have some in-class exercises where it makes sense to, to give you all handouts so that you can follow the handouts as we're going through things like Excel or MATLAB or whatnot. But by and large, I'm going to be using Blackboard quite a bit. Um, you all had me for Engineering 103. You know, we pretty much use Blackboard exclusively for that class, so I'm going to try and keep the same pattern here. I'm also going to use it quite a bit for uh, posting your grades uh, and things like that because I want everybody to have a clear understanding of, you know, where they're at in the class and and where they need to go to get A's or B's or, or, or whatever. Okay, so uh, basic fundamental stuff. Um, one thing I should mention, this class is, um, is actually somewhat coordinated. I'm teaching this with two other faculty here in the engineering division, so um, we're doing our best to try and make sure that we're all on the same schedule, so a, a lot of the work and topics that we discuss will be quite common among the sections. So, so hopefully that works out uh, pretty well throughout the semester. Um, a couple other things, let's see, course description. Um, I'll, I'll talk about specifically what it is that we're doing in here uh, a little bit later. I'm not going to get too deep into stuff like that now. A um, couple things about the, uh, the materials in the class. So um, if you went to the bookstore looking for a textbook for this class, you didn't find one because there isn't a textbook for this class. So um, hopefully that, that works out pretty well. It's less money you have to spend on books. Some of that stuff starts to add up. Um, there are a few supplies that you, you will need for the class, though. One of them is a, a calculator. There's a very particular calculator that we use in this class. It's a Casio FX115 ES Plus. It looks something like this. Um, I've got it listed here in the uh, syllabus. Make sure you're getting this one and not the ES or the MS or the MS Plus. There's a very specific reason that we use this calculator. Um, you all probably remember in 103 a lot of folks talking about getting your PE license. Remember, remember us discussing that? Well, um, in, that, um, in that licensure process, you have to take a series of exams. And this is one of the few calculators that's permitted to be used on the exams. You, know, you could go to the dollar store and buy a calculator that by and large is a piece of junk and can do a lot less than this. But because it's not on the list, they won't let you take the exam. 
So we focus on this calculator because it's one of the ones that's listed. And by and large, you get the most bang for your buck for this calculator. Depending on where you get it, it's around $20 or less. I think Walmart sells it for like $17. You can find it at Walmart. You can find it at a, a definitely find it on Amazon or something like that. Um, I don't know. Did, were, did anybody see if these were in the bookstore? I don't know if anybody looked. They. What's that? For these? That's not bad. So, go to Walmart. Um, but yeah, um, but yeah, you'll you'll want to get this, and you'll probably want to get it fairly soon. We're going to start to actually delve into this pretty quickly, probably within uh, within week two or something. So you'll want to try and get that pretty quick. Um, it's probably not a bad idea to have a flash drive. Um, you all can save stuff to your V drive as well, but um, a flash drive is probably not a bad idea. Also, uh, it's probably not a bad idea to use some cloud storage thing, maybe like Dropbox or Google Drive or something like that. We're going to be creating Excel files and MATLAB programs and whatnot throughout the semester, so it's uh, a good idea to just be able to back that up. The last thing you want to have happen is you, for you to lose your uh, your files and whatnot uh, uh, in the worst case, uh, you know, worst case scenario. All right. Uh, Let's see, grading basis. So this is, uh, uh, again, one of those classes where we really want to make sure that you're here because we have a lot of in-class activities, things like building uh, Excel files together and MATLAB programs together. So the attendance is, is going to be pretty heavy. So you do want to make sure that you're here on time. Attendance is going to be 20% of the grade. We have two exams in this class, a midterm and a final. We'll discuss those as we, we get closer to them, but those are each worth 25%. And then the homework takes up the rest. Um, and I, I'm going to go through the schedule, the, the class schedule here uh, later on. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Um, hopefully one of the things you'll find out pretty early about me is that I'm, I'm pretty easy to get along with. And, uh, you know, if, if you've got any questions, just raise your hand and say, Dr. Michelson, what the hell are you talking about? You know, and I'm, I'm pretty easy to get along with. I've had a few of you in, in other classes before, and I think they'll tell you I'm, 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 I'm pretty easy to get along when it comes to stuff like that. I definitely want to make sure that you're a... Uh, you're learning uh, what you need to learn. Uh, everybody good so far? Okay. So let's talk about why the heck you're even in this room because um, I, I always like to, uh, at least on day one, give you kind of an understanding uh, in regards to um, why you're taking a, a particular class because I, I think it sort of sets the stage and gives you a little bit of motivation for wanting to come. I mean, um, you know, I remember when I was in your position, uh, as an engineering student, I'm sitting here thinking, why am I in this history class? Like, really? Why? Why? I'm never going to use this stuff. You know, so. Uh, but, uh, so I, I think setting the stage at the beginning might help out. Um, let me give you uh, an example. So uh, a little bit about me. Uh, it, I'm sure you all remember from 103, but uh, uh, I'm a structural engineering professor. That, that's sort of my passion is structural engineering. I focus on things like uh, building design and bridge design and steel and concrete and things like that. That's sort of my area. And so uh, for those of you civil majors, how many civils I got in the room? All right, so you all are going to get to know me pretty well. I'm sorry, that was a joke, not a very funny one. Um, I, I'm going to be teaching classes later on like uh, steel design and structural analysis and mechanics of deformable bodies. And um, those classes all have their own specific uh, goals. So for, for instance, I'm teaching steel design this semester. And one of the goals of that course uh, is things like making sure that you can properly design beams in buildings or design bolted connections or welded connections or things like that. So in that class, we spend a lot of time talking about the code and talking about the specifications and, and how do columns behave and how do beams behave uh, and what have you. And we'll derive a, a lot of equations that we'll use for design. So I'll give you all some problem where I'll say, okay, here's a beam, it's yay long, it's got this load on it, here's the conditions, design the beam. And you go through and you use all the principles and procedures that we talk about in that class and you go through and do all the math and you come up with your beam size, whatever it is. But the one thing we won't talk about in that class is something like, well, here's the equation, here's the values, take this thing and make it work to, to spit out the right output. We don't talk about that in steel design or concrete design. We don't, we don't talk about using that in there. Why? Because you learned it in here. Okay? That's, that's sort of the whole point of this course is, is to learn the fundamental tools required to do the computations that you're going to do throughout your engineering career. And we focus on really three main mediums. We focus on this, again, 
primarily because this is by and large going to become your best friend for the next four years um, uh, throughout homework, throughout exams, and you know your FE exam later on, um, and also uh, two software programs specifically Excel and MATLAB. I'm just curious, does anybody have any experience with like Excel? I'm just curious. Okay, good. Um, that'll help out. If you don't have any experience with Excel, don't worry. It's not so bad. Um, we, we take it one step at a time. Um, uh, ultimately, ultimately, I think you'll have a, a lot of fun and, and, and I want you to, to get something out of it. We're also going to talk also about um, presentation of your, your calculations uh, as a whole. You know, it's one thing to be able to, to do your calculations uh, correctly. It's another thing to, to do them neatly and professionally. You know, um, uh, throughout my career, I've had to do a better job here and there improving things like my handwriting and, and drawing figures and diagrams and things like that. Like, I'm, I'm okay. I'm not the neatest person in the world, but, but you know, I've gotten better over time. But that stuff, it, it might not seem like it's a big deal, but it really can be uh, in the world of engineering. Uh, one very basic example is, you know, we, we live in a... a a society that I'm sure you're aware, um, but we live in a society that, that is somewhat litigious uh, at times, meaning things get litigated upon. In other words, lawsuits. Um, so it's very possible throughout your career that your calculations or your field notes or your data collection suddenly ends up as Exhibit A, you know. And if it's chicken scratch, then that's not going to look very good, right? And plus, your your calculate even you know that that's sort of a, a negative example, but a much more, I guess, realistic or positive example, I guess I would say, is your calculations need to be able to stand up to the scrutiny of independent review. What that means is very rarely does an engineer produce a design all on their own in their cubicle, you know, isolated from everybody else. Usually you're working in a team setting. You're producing a set of calculations and then usually a colleague or a coworker is going to be verifying your, your calculations. They're going to be doing a check of them. And if they don't understand what you're writing, then it's not going to go very well, right? So th that's the kind of stuff we're trying to focus on is, in this class is proper procedures for doing computations and just good work ethic, you know, neat work, professional work. Um, and that, that's really what we're, we're going to be doing throughout the semester. You know, th here and there we're probably going to be, you know, throwing um, equations at you and just saying, you know, trust us, this is the equation. You plug this value in and you get this value out. For now, I want you to sort of just put the blinders on and sort of go on faith that the equations that we present you in here are correct. Later on, when you take fluid mechanics or transportation or circuits or, or what have you, you'll then start to understand what these equations mean. For now, we just want you to be able to manipulate them. Just use something like this, use something like Excel uh, and the like. Sound good? Okay. So, a couple things. Um, attendance, uh, you all know the drill, just try and, and be here on time. I know it's early and, 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 and uh, 8 o'clock in the morning is usually not the, the best time for, for a class time, but I think we'll do, uh, we'll, we'll still have a lot of fun in here. Just try and be here on time. Um, I do, uh, uh, of course, uh, want to see you all engaged in class. I'm certainly fine with you all asking questions. I would prefer you asking questions if you're confused about anything, please don't hesitate at all to, to uh, make sure that you're understanding what we're talking about. Uh, do me a favor. I know that these things are very tempting, and there's these things like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all that. I know it's tempting, but, um, but please try, try and refrain from that. I, I think that won't be a big deal on days, for instance, where we're doing our in-class exercises because we're literally going to be working together step by step to produce certain programs and certain uh, spreadsheets and whatnot. So it's not really going to be a big deal. I mean, I, I don't have any problem if you're going on Blackboard and pulling up the notes and following along or if you're, you know, if we've got some MATLAB assignment you're going to Google to try and search some stuff on that. I don't have any problem with that at all. Um, just, you know, try and keep the, the social media presence down to a minimum during class. You all know the drill. Um, like I said, uh, in terms of communication, Blackboard, I'm going to be using Blackboard to post all the grades. Um, it's uh, all the lecture notes and whatnot are going to be posted. You should see the lecture that we're going to talk about today is already on Blackboard right now. You all are more than welcome to get on and log on to Blackboard if you would like right now. I don't, I don't have any problem with that. Um, one other point I would mention, 
uh, is email. By and large, the easiest way for me to communicate with you all is through email. Um, I have here an Android uh, phone and I have my Marshall email attached to my phone. If you haven't already done so, you know, whether or not you have an iPhone or, or what have you, it's probably a good idea to go ahead and attach your Marshall email to your phone because I know I'm not the only faculty that communicates with their students primarily through email. It's just a good idea to have it on your phone. You know, we, we tell uh, students, you know, they really should be checking their email daily. Well, if their email is attached to their phone, you don't really have to check it because as soon as you get something, boom, you know, it, 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 it pings at you. So I, I would go ahead uh, and do that. Um, also, if you're new to having a class uh, with me, um, you probably noticed at the very beginning of class this little countdown, that three, two, one, and you might notice this little thing clipped to my, uh, my lapel. I'm actually recording the lecture right now. There's a recording going on right now of the screen and of the audio, and then here and there we might do some calculations, and I'm not going to do them on the board. I'm going to do them on the screen with the pen so it'll show up. It'll almost be like John Madden calling a play or something. Um, but, but the idea is that um, when this is all said and done, this is all going to be deposited onto a single YouTube playlist. The link for that YouTube playlist is on Blackboard. So if for some reason you miss a lecture, you're going to get everything. Uh, you can get caught up pretty easily. Everything will be uh, on, on YouTube. Uh, I think everybody in freshman seminar tend to, tended to like that pretty well. So we're going to continue that pattern in here. Sound good? Yes. In fact, now that you mention it, um, let me go ahead and pull up the, the Blackboard. So I'm, if you all want, you're more than welcome to go ahead and log on. So um, I'm logged into my, uh, my Blackboard, and I'm going to pull up Engineering 111. Um, so here's the Engineering 111 site. I'm going to turn edit mode off, so this should look a little bit more like what you should see as a student as opposed to um, what I'm seeing as a faculty. So if I go over to course content, Okay, so for instance, here's course content, and you can see I've got the syllabus uploaded, and then where it says right here, YouTube playlist, I mean, you can click that, and then there it is. Now, there's nothing in there because we haven't, this is our first lecture, but as soon as this lecture uh, gets processed and uploaded, like, we'll stop recording whenever class ends, and then it takes a little time to process the file and upload it to YouTube. I'll throw it onto this playlist so you won't have to memorize, you know, or ha have to keep track of, you know, 50 different URLs. It's all the same URL and it'll all be in the same spot. So, does that sound good? All right. Um, let me close this. If you go to lecture notes, you'll see the, uh, the lecture notes and the slides uh, for today. But as, as the semester progresses, we'll just have lecture notes going on down the line. They'll, they'll just all be uh, uh, collecting down there. I'll also post uh, homework assignments as well as, uh, as grades and whatnot. So, um, sound good? Then, I mean, again, if you have any other questions, please, you know, feel free to ask. So, sound good? When in doubt, I would check the uh, the the um, the Blackboard page just to ensure that, that everything's up to date. This is usually my primary, you know, go-to to make sure everything's uh, up to date. Um, you know, posting the lecture notes, posting the homeworks, and things like that. So, uh, so I, I would use that and, and refer to that pretty heavily. Um, I'm not gonna go too nuts into the honor policy and the academic dishonesty policy. You know, you all can read it. Just, I, I think you all are grown-ups. You know the drill. Just, you know, don't cheat. So, all right. Okay. So far, so good? All right. Um, so let's talk a little bit about homework and, and submission formatting. Uh, I mentioned that one of the big, uh, uh, one of the big, uh, uh, I guess points of this course is to ensure that you're producing your calculations and presenting them in a clear fashion uh, and whatnot. So um, a couple points. Uh, we'll assign homework throughout the semester and it's usually due at the beginning so we meet at 8 a.m. So usually at 8 a.m. I'm just going to collect a pile of homework uh, right here. Now some assignments um, will, will be done you know on paper. Some of them you know, like the Excel assignments or the MATLAB assignments you're actually not going to turn a physical document in, you're just going to submit a file, like, you know, submit your Excel file or submit your program or whatnot. And, and so in those cases, a lot of these formatting requirements might not make a lot of sense, you know, like using a straight edge. Well, it's, it's Excel. I'm not going to take a ruler onto my screen or something. It's a joke, not a very funny one. Um, 
so we're going to assign the homework during lecture. Sometimes the, the homeworks might not even be given to you. We might not give you a hard copy. It may just be posted uh, on Blackboard. Um, so uh, just make sure you're, you're, you're paying attention. If it is a, a handwritten assignment, make sure it's legible, make sure it's neat, make sure you, uh, you understand what's going on. And uh, because of the number of students, uh, not just in this class, but in, in all the other sections because of the coordination, we're not going to uh, accept late homework. Um, but that really shouldn't be a big deal for this class because by and large, you should have plenty of time to finish the assignments in class. And if you're working at home, I mean, I would doubt on average you're spending more than an hour outside of class working on this stuff. It's, it's pretty, uh, pretty basic stuff. All right, um, let's see. So I've got here some, some items in terms of uh, a format. Instead of, instead of going through that, what I thought I would do is go through uh, this. So I have here a sample homework that, um, that I posted yesterday. Um, I apologize, apologies for the confusion. It's not due today. I just threw that on here to give you kind of an idea. If you've got a handwritten assignment, typically you're going to want a few things on here. And this is pretty uh, representative of uh, what you're going to be doing, not just in here, but throughout your, your, your engineering career, regardless if it's fluid mechanics or circuits or, or what have you. So uh, you're, you'll want a cover page, something like having your name, uh, having the class. For, for, for this class, it's probably a good idea to have not just the class, but the section number as well. You know, later on, if it's something like steel design, there's only one section, so that's not a big deal. Uh, make sure you're putting the assignment title, you know, when it's assigned and when it's due. And I have here a, a, a pretty basic problem. So, um, for instance, the problem is determine the volume of a typical classroom in this building and express your answer in cubic meters. It's, it's, this isn't meant to be you know, anything very complicated. It's just meant to give you an idea about how we, we tend to uh, format um, calculations uh, in engineering. So your given information might be something like how long the room is, how wide the room is, how tall it is. So we'll say it's 40 foot uh, long by 20 foot wide and we'll say it's an 8 foot tall uh, room. So um, typically in, in a lot of uh, engineering computations, you're going to have some sort of diagram that goes along with it. Now this is a pretty basic diagram. Um, I'll show you an example here in a second of something that's a little more realistic of something that you'll see later. So this is just a diagram of what a typical room would look like. We're assuming that the room is a box, you know, so, so that the volume of that room is length times width times height, you know, so that actually is a really uh, reasonable assumption, which for these rooms isn't necessarily true. I mean, you look in the back and you've got a column line right there, so it's not quite a full box because there's a block out right there. So, um, you know, but that's a pretty reasonable assumption for a typical room. We go through and do the computations, make sure we're doing appropriate unit conversions, and then we get uh, 181 cubic meters. And you all can go through and calculate that out, and you'll see that that works. Um, sometimes if you've got a, a, a fairly complex um, calculation, it's not the worst idea to try and check your answer with some pretty rough estimates. So what I did is I, I uh, this solutions check, basically the idea is this is a lot of stuff that I could do in my head, a lot of mental math. You know, over here on this first page is stuff that I would need a calculator to do, you know, 3.281 raised to the third power and then 6400 divided by that. I can't do that in my head. But some of this stuff I can, like 40 times 20 times 10, it's basically, you know, 4 times 2 times 1. That stuff you can do in your head pretty easily. And then rounding out my, my conversion factor to the nearest tenths place, saying, you know, 1 cubic meter for, per uh, 40 cubic feet. The idea is, you know, if I, if I do a, a rough calc, I'm getting 200 cubic meters. This gives me an idea that the calculation I'm doing is, uh, it's at least the right magnitude, and the answer that I got uh, was a, of a reasonable value. Like if I did a, a rough calculation and I'm getting that the volume is 20,000 cubic meters and I only got 181 using the, the, the straight value, so I probably did something wrong. You know what I mean? So, so that, that's usually not the, the worst idea in the world to ensure that you, your, your answer at least makes uh, some sense. Now, th this is a, 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 a fairly elementary example. This is pretty basic. Let me give you kind of an idea of something that you would see a little later, and this is a, a really a, a real-life example of what you would see later. 
So this is a, a solution for a homework that I gave in steel design back in 2015. Um, to give you kind of an idea, what we're looking at is we're looking at various elements uh, in buildings that are subjected to tension. So we're talking about elements that are being pulled on. And we're looking at things like uh, the capacity of the connection right there around the bolts. And we're doing some basic member design. You know, if I have a piece of steel that's being yanked on and I'm putting 150,000 pounds on it, what piece of steel should I pick? Do I need an angle? Do I need a channel? Do I need an I-beam? What size I-beam? Uh, etc. So you'll look, you know, you can see a lot of the very, you know, very similar, um, uh, you know, elements. You know, for instance, I've got a diagram. You know, the diagram is, is uh, it's, uh, not saying I'm the neatest guy in the world, but you, I think even if you, you've never been exposed to steel design, you can kind of get an idea of what's going on. And you've got a piece of steel. It's being yanked on. You can kind of see where the bolts are, where the connection is. You, know, you can see that in later problems. So if I zoom out and I go to, let's say like right here. You know, even without being exposed to steel design, I think you can kind of see what's going on. You know, I, again, another connection. I've got the dimensions laid out. You know, that's three inches, four inch spacing. That's five inches uh, and what have you. You can see like thickness values and areas and whatnot, you can kind of get an idea of what's going on. But the big point I want to um, I want to make is, you know, with a little bit of uh, a care, you can produce some really neat, um, clear professional results. And this is what is going to be expected of you when you get out of here and you're detailing steel structures or sizing gears or doing flow calculations for channels or, or circuits analysis or what have you. This is what is being expected of you when you get out of here. So the, the ability to produce the, these, I mean, these neat calculations, it's kind of important. Um, does anybody have any questions at all? Again, I, I ask that quite a bit, but I do want to make sure everybody's uh, on point and, and sounding good. All right. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, let's keep going, trucking through the syllabus, make sure that we're good. Okay, exams. I know that um, uh, everybody in here is uh, is always interested in that. Of course, I don't refer to them ex as exams. I always call them celebrations of learning. So we're going to be celebrating twice this semester. Um, we have I say I say we have a midterm exam and a final exam. That's not really true. Our midterm exam is actually a little early. It, it, it's um, I, if I remember correctly, I think it's like week seven or something like that. Let's see. Yeah, it's in week seven, so um, you know it, it, it covers a little bit less material. Our, our first exam primarily covers the calculator and Excel and some of the fundamental stuff we do by hand. And exam two is primarily talking about uh, MATLAB. So they're not very comprehensive exams. I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of comprehensive exams either. You know, I like to have an exam on a particular topic and then we move on and talk about something else. I think it makes it a little easier on, on the students uh, as well. And as long as I'm testing you on your abilities, I'm, I'm certainly fine to, uh, to get along with that. Um, the exams in this class uh, tend to kind of be two-parters. You know, you'll have a part of the exam where you're doing you know, some hand calculations, and then you'll have another part of the exam where we give you some task and then say, all right, now do it in Excel and submit your file, or write the program in MATLAB and submit your file. So, yeah, you know, it's a it's a little bit uh, back and forth. Uh, hopefully, they, they shouldn't be a, a time crunch. I'm usually not the biggest fan of having uh, exams where you know it, I'm testing you on your ability to write and fast and punch buttons in the calculator. I'm more interested in testing your ability to do the computations, not how fast you are. In real in 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 the real world, you know, that's not an issue. So um, I don't want that to be a problem. Okay. Course outcomes, I, I'm going to soft pedal that. It's pretty basic stuff. I do want to talk a little bit about the schedule so that you all kind of have an understanding of what's going on. So um, this is the, the lecture schedule for this semester. I call it tentative because, um, first off, I want to make sure that we're on point and that we're meeting everything on time. And, and I'm personally of the opinion that if there's something that, you know, maybe we did something in Excel that was a little confusing, I'd rather, you know, take a moment, make sure we're understanding that, and if that delays us a few minutes you know, in future weeks, I'm fine with that. that. That's no big deal. I'd rather take the time and make sure that you're understanding what we're talking about than, well, oh, it's Thursday, we've got to talk about this. You know? So I'll, I'll take my time and make sure that, that we're all clear on that. 
Um, a couple things. I've got in here the dates that we're assigning homework and when they're due. So hopefully that's not a uh, that won't surprise you throughout the semester. So you know today we're not assigning any homework, but for instance on Thursday we're going to assign homework one, and it will then be due next Thursday. But you'll have plenty of time next Thursday and then next Tuesday to work on those uh, assignments during class. Okay, sound good? All right. A couple other things. So. On lecture number six, which is on Thursday, January the 26th, um, I have that called as a, as a makeup day. And basically the long and short of that for, for lecture six is um, uh, you all probably remember us discussing the student organizations like uh, uh, ASME and whatnot. Well, well the, the civil engineering organization, uh, SAME ASCE, hosts an annual technical conference here on Marshall's campus. And so all the, the students that are in the student chapter, as well as me as the, the faculty advisor, uh, are going to be tied up with that. So um, I'm not going to be here. So what we're going to do is the, the room will be open. And if you're still working on, let's say, homework two or something, you can come in. But for all rights, class is going to be canceled that day on the, on the 6th. Um, one other point, um, I'm actually not going to be here on the 24th, but another faculty is going to come in and cover that lecture. So we'll still be. Uh, uh, on time. So we will have class on the 24th. I won't be here, but, but we'll still have class. But on the 26th, by and large, you can come in and work on homework if you need, but class is really going to be canceled. I would, uh, if you have uh, the time and the opportunity, I would come check out the conference. It's over in the student center, in the basement of the student center, right near where all those uh, pool tables and whatnot are. Um, uh, a lot of, uh, you, you'll hear a lot of interesting stuff there. And, and plus, it's a great way to, uh, to network and to meet professionals. I can't tell you the number of students that have told us, you know, as they were leaving, I got jobs because I met the right person at that conference. So you'll definitely want to consider uh, uh, showing up and, 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 and maybe meeting some people and rubbing some elbows. And next thing you know, it might work out for you in the end. Okay. All right. So a um, couple other things. So we, we keep on trucking along throughout the semester. Um, if you notice here for the exams, we have the exam, like exam one scheduled on Thursday, February 23rd, but on the 21st, we have an exam one review. And, and here's the way that I treat exam reviews. Um, if you've had me for class, you, you know how I do this. I come in and I give you all a little packet, or, you know, a few slides that say, okay, here's the stuff we're going to test you on on the exam. And then I let you all ask what ever questions you want about whatever. Okay, you can ask me anything. You can ask me what's the answer to problem one. I won't tell you, but you, you can ask. Um, <laughs> there we go. I've, I've got, I, I'll get you all laughing throughout the semester, I promise. Um, but uh, I, I really like to let you all just sort of exhaust every single conceivable, conceivable question that you have. Because uh, I, I found that um, you know, in that environment, by having these review sessions, the students understand the material a little better, and they do better on the exams. And, and, and it, you know, if I could give every single person in the, in the class 100 on the exams, I, I'd be tickled. You know, I probably won't be able to do that, but, um, but we'll see. <laughs> um, but yeah, come in on that day just prepared to ask whatever. If you want to go through you know, an example that we did in class, or there was this homework problem that you didn't understand, or um, what's going on with Solver in Excel, you know, all that. You know, just, it's, you know, Open, open uh, time to ask whatever you want. Okay. Now I have a couple other makeup days listed uh, in the syllabus. Every single spring semester that I have taught here at Marshall University, we have had some measure of a delay due to snow. Okay. So I am predicting the same thing will happen. Now, let's say the sky is parked and we have no snow delays and that we're on time. Thursday, March 16th, we will cancel class, and then it's spring break. Sound reasonable? We can have class, though, if you want. Everybody you want to go ahead and do that? Yeah, uh, that, that now, now we're getting, getting some reaction. Now we're getting some, some, some activity out of everybody. <laughs> all right. Um, a couple other things. If you notice in the schedule, what we've tried to do is cover all the um, calculator and Excel stuff up until spring break. That way we're not starting MATLAB right before spring break because if we start MATLAB right before spring break and then you all go and have uh, your, your uh, Mai Tais and whatnot, 
uh, during spring break and you come back and like MATLAB what's that so um, so we figured we'd wait until after spring break to cover all the MATLAB again we have another makeup day again uh, I've got really uh, I guess three makeup days in the in the schedule due to snow and things like that so again if we don't have a delay we won't meet all right so you'll have class off that day sound good Everybody okay with that last day of the semester we'll have another review and then um, our exam two we're in section 202 so we'll be in here on Thursday May the 4th at 8 a.m. and then that's it any questions all right um, if that's the case then what I will do is go ahead and at least try and briefly discuss uh, some of these notes and give you kind of an idea uh, of just some of the general stuff that we talk about uh, in this course. Um, I'm going to soft pedal a lot of this. Um, so again, hi, I'm Dr. Michelson. Um, I will uh, say a couple things. So here's my office and my, uh, my email. As for my office location, all you got to do is go down these stairs. I'm on the second floor. There's a line of offices on the other side of the hall, and I'm the last one on the left. It's, it's right here. In fact, uh, you, if you left the room right now, you could probably reach my office by the time I finish this sentence. So, you know, plenty, uh, you know, really easy to get there. Again, I'm a bridge guy, bridge engineering, steel design. Yes, I went to that school up north, so forgive me. All right, um, and then I'm not going to go through the grading scale or the homeworks and the exams and all that because you all know the drill. Okay, we talked about uh, problem presentation uh, abilities. Make sure that you're listing all your assumptions, your diagrams, calculations. It's all neat and all that. Um, and then we went through the sample homework, so I don't really need to discuss that. Okay. Um, we did also discuss the idea of, of checking your answer, making sure that your final answer uh, is reasonable. Um, one big thing that we'll talk about later is, uh, is units. You know, I, you all are freshmen, and, I, and I'm teaching senior level structural engineering design courses, and I've taught graduate level uh, structural engineering design courses, and I don't care if they're freshmen all the way to seniors and grad students. It seems that, like units, I, I, students still have problems with units. So we are going to spend a little bit of time ensuring that, uh, that, that we, we understand that. I mean, you know, that I, I have here, you know, making sure that your units come out uh, right. For instance, uh, in structural analysis, I, I'll give uh, uh, exam questions that involve finding beam deflections. So if you're, you've got a beam and you've got some load on it, you're trying to determine how much the beam bends. So you should get an answer that's something like inches. You know, it bends, you know, one inch or one and a half inches uh, or what have you. And I have students that are coming out with square meters. It's like, that doesn't make sense. You know, so making sure that your, your, you know, the, the result makes sense is something that's, uh, that's important. Um, one other way to check your answer, and this is something that you really can't do now because you don't have it, but is with experience. Now, if you give me a, 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 a load, let's say, you know, 200,000 pounds, and you tell me a length of a column, I can, you know, reasonably guess how large that column needs to be because I'm a structural engineer. I'm a steel designer. That's my deal, you know. So I can give, I can look at a problem and say, that seems about right, or that, that's way off, you know, because I've got the experience. With time, you'll get that too. And make sure that you're, um, you're valuing that, that experience and valuing your judgment. Uh, I'd argue that the single uh, greatest computational tool that you all have is your judgment. You know, um, we have a lot of tools that are available to us as engineers. I mean, we've got uh, calculators, software, we've got apps that'll do you know just about any calculation we want but I'd argue judgment is really the the number one um, issue you know there's a there's a trend in the engineering discipline and it's a little scary sometimes but there's a trend that um, I, I, I take the values I put it into the computer and I press the little button and it gives me the answer and I think I did engineering and, and if that's what you think engineering is uh, you're dead wrong. That is not even close. You know, um, I have been on the end, uh, 
of the situation where I've been a user of, let's say, structural engineering software, and I have found errors in the software, you know, big errors. Um, and so much so that I've reported those errors back to the manufacturers of the software, and they go, oh, you're right, you know, that's a big one. And then they go and they release uh, uh, patches to the software that fix it. Let me ask a question. How many gamers do I have in the room? You know, Call of Duty, you know, or World of Warcraft, or, or what have you. Well, what happens when you, 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 let's say you play Call of Duty or something, and then somebody like Dr. Michelson gives you some massive project, and it takes you two or three weeks to do it, and you don't, you, you, know, you don't have time to play Call of Duty until you finish that steel design project that Dr. Michelson gave you. And then you go, okay, i got to get back on Call of Duty. You turn your PlayStation on. What's the first thing that happens? It updates, right? You're downloading patches and, 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 and bug fixes and whatnot. So think, you know, you've got these programs that are written by people that need to be fixed every now and then, right? That's what it's gotten to at this point. That you know, and it happens with everything. With you know, I mean, we release versions of Windows every now and then, versions of Excel every now and then, games, you name it. So, if you if you honestly believe that that programs are infallible and that they're always going to be right, that's incorrect. Okay, and I'm not saying computational tools aren't nice. I mean, goodness, uh, some of some of the the Designs that we do nowadays, I, I, I'd argue they wouldn't be possible without, uh, without computational tools like, like finite elements or programming or Excel or things like that. But you need to make sure that your, that your judgment is, is sound as well. There's an old saying that, um, uh, um, uh, that engineers use uh, called back of the envelope calculations where you know, they take an envelope and just rough some calculations out on the back of an envelope. And there's uh, an old saying in engineering that if you can't rough it out on the back of an envelope and get, you know, within 90% of the answer, then A, you shouldn't be designing it, and B, something's wrong, okay? Um, so make sure that, you know, you're, you're, you're using your, your common sense and your judgment uh, appropriately. I think it's really important. Um, I'm going to show you a few cases to illustrate why the stuff that we're talking about uh, is really important. I'm curious. Hold on, let me see something. Is that better? Is that better? All right, I'm going to start doing that. Okay. Um, how many of you have heard of this? Has anybody heard of this? Okay, so I've got a couple people that have heard of this. This was a collapse of a civic center out in Connecticut. This was a, a basketball uh, arena that it collapsed, or collapsed under excessive snow load. Okay? Now, I guess the, I would say the community there was damn lucky that it happened when it did because it happened at like 3 o'clock in the morning, okay? In fact, they had just had a big game uh, in the arena that night, and then the, uh, uh, the roof collapsed at about 3 o'clock in the morning. Now, if you've heard of that, then, then that should be, that, that's probably the details of the story that, that are the most commonly known, okay? Now, here's why it collapsed. So the reason it collapsed was because engineers trusted the computer, okay? They built what's called a, a, a finite element model uh, of the roof. And a, a finite element model is, is basically just a fancy way of saying a, a computer model where they, they analyze the, the stresses on the roof, how much it deformed, how much bending there was, how much it was being stretched, uh, and whatnot. Um, it's a computer model that they used ultimately for design. They would run this model. The model would tell them, okay, this brace has about 20,000 pounds of force on it, so we need to use this member. Or this brace has 50,000 pounds, so it need, needs to be a little bigger, etc. Problem is they didn't model it correctly. The uh, assumptions that they made during the creation of that computer model were not valid because they didn't match the real life conditions uh, of the roof. What ended up happening was when we create a computer model for a system like this, we usually assume that all the members meet at a common point. Like if you've ever seen a, uh, uh, like a roof truss or something like that, we assume that all the, the boards and all the elements all meet at a common point. Well, that didn't really happen uh, when they actually built this roof. A lot of the members were offset, so they bent a whole lot more than, than they thought they did, and that's what happened. Okay? So, 
you know, if they had actually, you know, had a little bit of communication with the fabricators and the folks that were actually constructing the roof, they would have seen, oh goodness, the computer model wasn't exactly right. So that was a, that's a big issue. Um, this one's probably a little more familiar. How many have heard of this, the Mars Climate Orbiter? Okay. This one is, a, you know, fortunately this wasn't a, an issue where people died, but this was certainly an issue that cost uh, a fair amount of cash. So um, this was launched in uh, the late 90s to assess some of the uh, topographical and uh, climate conditions on the surface of Mars. Um, what happened was, in, uh, in 1999, right as the, the craft was nearing the, uh, uh, nearing the, 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 its region of orbit, uh, it went into insertion, which meant instead of orbiting the, the planet, it sort of started to uh, land quite quickly. And because they didn't account for the speed uh, associated with its descent, you know, you have something that's going through the atmosphere that quickly, you get a lot of drag. Drag creates friction. Friction creates heat the craft pretty much disintegrated in the atmosphere. So, you know, it didn't actually crash, it just sort of, you know, disappeared as it was landing. And the reason why was units, okay? That's, it's as simple as that. Lockheed Martin, which is a, a fairly large defense contractor, they do a lot of work for the military and for NASA and folks like that, they produced a particular program controller that was built in U.S. units. NASA was expecting them in metric. That's all it took, you know. So something, something super simple, stuff that we discuss in here, you know, freshmen and undergrad uh, are discussing issues that affected, you know, NASA engineers couldn't get right, you know. So this stuff, it is important, okay. So make sure you're, you're you know, you're paying attention to this stuff. Um, this one, I'm going to say that none of you have heard of. But this one in, in my field is, is a, was a really big deal. Um, this was a collapse of a pedestrian bridge uh, in New York. Um, this one unfortunately did kill um, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the construction workers. What ended up happening was, um, you know, they had this, this large steel, it's called a tub girder. It's basically, you know, you've got a bottom flange and you've got two webs and you've got these two top flanges up top, and then they would pour the, the concrete deck on there. Well, when you place a concrete deck on a steel beam, you've got a whole bunch of wet concrete that's really heavy sitting on a steel beam by itself. Now, one of the, the you know, steel design 101 rules of thumb is, you know, if you've got something that's in compression, it needs to be braced, okay? Because things that are in compression like to experience a mode called buckling. You know, imagine if you had like a, like a yardstick in your hand and you take it and you press like this and it suddenly wants to bow out real quick, right? That phenomenon is called buckling. And things that are in compression uh, tend to fail very suddenly and very quickly. And the way that you can prevent that is to brace it, to actually put something on the outside that prevents it from wanting to kick out and twist. Now they had a lot of bracing inside the tub, you know, on the inside there was bracing, but they didn't have any bracing on the outside. So they started pouring this concrete deck and then it went and killed somebody. So this is stuff that, that's, uh, that's kind of important. And you, you'll hear about stuff like this throughout your career. You know, if you take geomatics, you'll probably hear about the Lake Pagenor disaster where they were drilling uh, out in Louisiana and they hit a, 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 a adjacent salt mine and they basically caused massive amounts of damage and millions of dollars in damage because somebody didn't measure their, their, their survey correctly uh, and what have you. So this type of stuff is, 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 uh, is pretty important. I don't, I don't mean for the, for the day one lecture to sound like a bunch of doom and gloom. I just, I, I want there to be a little bit of importance and a little bit of, uh, uh, I guess, seriousness, if you will, in terms of the topics that we're talking about. Uh, I promise after today it's all smiles and fun. <laughs> as many as there can be at 8 o'clock in the morning, right? <laughs> All right, does anybody have any questions? All right, so let, bless you. Um, here's what we're going to talk about, uh, you know, for the next couple days. 
we're going to begin a, a series of lectures on fundamental computational tools, things like how to appropriately address units, how to handle significant figures. Um, uh, has anybody heard of significant figures? Okay, so we'll, we'll talk about that. How to, um, uh, how to do unit conversions, how to do linear interpolation. You know, it's some very fundamental basic stuff that you're going to be doing throughout your curriculum. And then after that, we'll start getting into the, uh, the use of the calculator. So I guess uh, I don't have a formal homework assignment for you other than if you haven't already gotten one of these, I would get one now, and it's pretty cheap. I was going to say it was under 20 bucks, but my, my man here in the back found one for about $7, so go for it. All right, anything else? All right, if you haven't already signed the sign-in sheet, it should be making its way around. Please do so. With that... Like I said, there'll be some days where we end early, and that's all I've got for you today. We will see you on Thursday. I guess if you haven't already done so, you can go get some breakfast this morning. All right, that's all we got.